Okay. Do you think we should begin? Or we'll give it a few more minutes. I wonder if the others are actually waiting uh, in the other uh, Zoom session. What should I do? Should I try to get into that session just in case there are some of them waiting there? Because I'm not exactly sure if I am able to do that. Uh, hold on. Okay. Um, yeah, Luke, if you could post a message on Hookroot, assuming it's working. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drop out of this session quickly just to check if there might be some students in the other uh, Zoom meeting ID. Oh, Peter is back. Okay. Do you suppose we might be missing anyone else? Okay, I'll probably send out another email just to be sure. I guess we could begin. Do, do you mind if uh, we begin right now? Would that be all right? And, um, well, it's going to be recorded anyway. I did send a message earlier, probably about an hour or two hours ago, informing everyone that we will be using a new or a different Zoom meeting ID, mainly because there is another class which will actually be using the Zoom license that I had used initially to book the tutorial session tonight. So uh, do, you, do you suppose we could begin? Would that be all right? Can I get a yes or a no from all of you? Okay, so let's begin. So the focus of tonight's session is going to be uh, on the topic on intention to create uh, legal relations. And But before we start discussing the topic and dealing with the uh, tutorial problem, I wonder if there might be any questions or comments that any of you might wish to make before we proceed with tonight's topic. So would there be any questions, comments you might wish to make from anyone there? Uh, I was just wondering, Mandra, just about the semester planning assessment. Um, yeah. Obviously, because you've been in hospital and everything, it's, gonna, it's been a bit delayed with the marking. I'm just wondering if you have a uh, idea of when you'll have those issued. Um, the, I, I meant to return the assessment marks actually by tomorrow. So I've still got a day. I've actually started marking them. Um, hopefully, I'll finish them tomorrow. Otherwise, the day after Christmas, I should be able to get everything done. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the the surgical procedure went okay, by the way. Unless the biopsy shows otherwise, I know the results two weeks from now. But uh, initially, things seem to be good. So um, yeah. The uncertainty has kind of disappeared from me now, which is good. Anything else anyone may wish to say or uh, make a comment on? Yeah, thank you, Chris. So we could proceed? Okay, let's proceed. So tonight, we're going to be digging deep into the topic on intention to create legal relations. And so after, yeah, so I'm just making sure that this is recorded. So after studying this topic, 
uh, you should be able to demonstrate knowledge of the elements of intention to create a legally binding contract, the objective test of intention, and the legal presumptions which apply when consider considering the objective tests. So let's proceed by uh, looking at the tutorial question. Can I get a volunteer to read the tutorial question for us? You can ask one of you, Liu, Martin, Sophie, Peter, or Chris, to read the tutorial question for us. That's a nice cat there, Martin. How old is the cat? Ah, uh, okay. Uh, okay, so Sophie has no mic. That leaves us with just the four of you there. Can I get a volunteer? Liu, can you do it? Oh, um, I'll give it a go. Thank you. So Katrina and Richard were both big fans of 1950s retro styling. Katrina owned a dress shop which specialised in rock and roll style dresses, most of which she designed and manufactured herself. As a result, she was always looking out for old magazines or other sources of inspiration. Richard, on the other hand, ran a record store selling old-fashioned vinyl records. He had a sideline business of authentically repairing 1950s jukeboxes. One day, Katrina came into Richard's store looking for hard-to-find music from the era. They fell to talking about their mutual hobby, and Katrina ended up placing an order to purchase the jukebox Richard had almost finished restoring. They stayed in touch for about a year as Richard set aside the rarest and most unusual records to give Katrina first re refusal. One day, Katrina suggested they should combine their efforts to start a business running a 1950s diner, which would provide the perfect opportunity to showcase Katrina's fashion and Richard's music. Richard agreed enthusiastically. They were both experienced business operators and, I, and both understood the need to have their paperwork in order. They also recognised that running a partnership would be very different from each of them running their own businesses. They brought in a third partner, Emma, who had previously run a cafe before taking time off to start a family. Eventually, they opened the business, and for a while it did very well, which resulted in even greater profits for Richard and Katrina's personal businesses, as they capitalised on the enthusiasm for the 1950s, which came from the patrons of the designer. Along the way, Richard and Katrina found that their mutual interests and at the time that and the time that was spending they were spending together led quite naturally to a personal attraction. By the first anniversary of the diner's opening, they were a couple. By the second anniversary, however, things were not going so well. The additional business favoured Katrina's personal business much more than Richard's, and both he and Emma felt that Katrina was not pulling her weight. The, dissatis the dissatisfaction was also putting pressure on Richard and Katrina's relationship. They all hung, hung in there for as long as they could, but in the end, Richard and Emma have come to see you to obtain advice about whether they can terminate the contract they all signed when the diner was first opened. Advise Richard and Emma separately as to the following. Uh, do you want me to read out the questions as well? Sorry, I think your mic's off, Manjo. Sorry, my mic was off. Um, yep, can you please read the four questions for us? Yep, no worries. So, A, what presumption will the law apply in relation to their intention to create legal relations under the contract? B, who will bear the burden of rebutting that presumption? C, in the end, is the contract just justiciable? D, what is the strongest argument against your position? Okay, um, I'll give you a few seconds or even a minute to think about the question or the questions and then we can proceed to discuss it.
So I'm just picking up the uh, answer of Martin. Okay, uh, can I get the answers from everyone else? Uh, can I get the answers of Luke, Sophie, Peter, and Chris, if you could? Can you put your answers in the chat box? So I'm getting the answer of Luke, and this one is coming from Sophie. Okay. So it would appear that the uh, common answer of the group is that in terms of the intention to create legal relations, that there is a presumption that they in fact intended to create legal relations. So the presumption here is not that um, there is a commercial relationship. The presumption is that there is an intention to create legal relationships because what they had was a commercial relationship. So when you speak of the presumption here, the presumption is that there is an intention uh, of the parties uh, the three parties for the matter to, to enter into a uh, to have a to create legal relations and the reason for that presumption is because what they have is actually a commercial relationship at the start okay so so it's not so much a it's not so much an implication uh, it's not so much a presumption that it is a commercial relationship it is a presumption that there is an intention to create legal relationships mainly because what they had at the start was a uh, business relationship in the first place. Now I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going to, again, get the comment of Martin and put it on the screen. That's good. Okay, so are we clear? So as far as the presumption is concerned, the presumption here is that there was an intention on the part of the parties to create a legal relationship. So it is not a presumption that there is a, a business relationship. The presumption is that there is an intention to create a legal relationship. But the reason why that presumption arises is because if you look at the relationship that they had, it was a business relationship or a commercial relationship at the outset. So the, the question here is not so much as to the uh, as to the kind of relationship they have they had and what the law will presume, because actually that is a question of fact. The, our focus is what is the legal presumption of the law? What will the law read into the situation? And the, and the law in this case will read into the situation that there is an in, there was an intention to create a legal uh, relation because of the existence of a commercial relationship at the outset okay so what, was that clear now um, I wonder if it's a good time to muddy the waters a bit at this time should we go through all the questions or should we begin to kind of complicate things at this time I wonder how, how best to approach this uh, let, let me just take uh, it's a good thing that Martin has raised this. Okay, uh, it's a good thing that Martin has raised this point about there having been a third party who wasn't a friend. Okay, so perhaps let's begin to complicate things at this point. Okay, now, uh, so as I said, there are two ways of doing this. We could first go through all the four questions and answer them, 
or at this point, we could start changing some of the facts in the scenario. And, uh, you know, for the purpose of digging deeper into the question about the presumption. And I would think if it's all right with you, yeah, that, that's the point of Martin. Yeah, that's right, Martin. So to money the waters, what if they were in a relationship before going to business? So Martin has raised it anyway. So why don't we confront that point? Because I think that's a crucial point here. So what if when they were going into the relationship, they were in fact in a relationship? Okay, so let me repeat. We're changing the, um, the factual scenario now, and we're just simply addressing uh, question A. We're not addressing the other questions yet. So what we're doing, and I hope you don't get lost in, in, you know, in when we do this, we're changing the facts a bit, the scenario a bit in the sense that let us make the assumption that all the other facts being the same. The only change is that at the time that they entered into this contract, the three of them, uh, Richard and Carolyn, was it, and Katrina, were in a relationship. Because if you look at the facts, the relationship happened one year after they had entered into a contract. So what if, when they first started, uh, what if at the time they entered into a contract to put up this business venture, uh, Katrina and uh, Richard were already in a relationship? My question would then be, uh, what presumption do you suppose will the law apply? in relation to, I'm trying to remove this chat box here, it's blocking my view, uh, hold on. Okay, there. Okay, so let me, let me repeat the question. So if, assuming that at the time that the three parties uh, entered into a business venture, Katrina and Richard were already in a relationship, the question is what? legal presumption will the law apply in relation to their intention to create legal relations under the contract so that is not the new question can you just put your answer there okay so we've got an answer from luke mm -hmm. so this is the answer of luke the presumption will be the same due to them understanding the need to have their paperwork in order also including a third party okay How about the others? Uh, Martin, for Martin, I'm just going to read this because it's quite long. I'm reading that the answer of Martin mainly to enable those who will be watching the recording later on to know what was actually in the chat box because there is a disconnect between the chat box and what actually appears on the screen. So for Martin, Unless Martin, want, unless Martin wants to read his answer? Yeah, I'll do it. Okay, thank you. Me? Yes, I could, I could, Martin. Um, yeah, so I said that I don't think it matters. Um, so the, the, the nature of the agreement by our business is made by two various business people. So the, the very nature of that agreement. Uh, Ma Martin, I'm having a hard time hearing you, Martin. You might have to come closer to your mic there, sorry. Sorry, is that a little better? Yeah, that's a lot better, yes. Okay, so I, I said I, I think it doesn't really matter because you know, the nature of the agreement was one to start and collaborate in, in running a business and it was made by experienced business people. If on the other hand the agreement was a little bit different, say one would invest or that perhaps someone would get a share or, or these sorts of things, you might be able to have a relationship and that there was no intention to create legal relations. But a good indication is that the creation of the partnership agreement in writing and brought up the party. So on that basis, it expects that argument's always going to fail. Okay. Thank you. Uh, did anyone else want to say something? Okay. Uh, can somebody wait, wait, that somebody that's somebody's mic. I'm gonna have to turn off the rest of the mics. Now if somebody wishes to say anything, you're gonna have to tell me. Okay, the mics have been off. I've been turned off. Okay. Okay, now so one of the reasons why we would probably assume, as everyone has said, 
that there is in fact an intention to create legal relations, it is because of the fact that there is a third party who is in a friend. And from the very start, as pointed out by Luke and Martin, for example, they were making sure that they, they had the proper paperwork. So those are indications that they, in fact, intended to create legal relations. Now, let's just make some changes again a bit more in the factual scenario. So let's assume that there isn't any third party. And... Uh, Let's assume that there was no discussion on the paperwork. So we're changing some of the factual facts of the scenario. So remember, we've changed the scenario a bit. We're making the assumptions. So remember, for those of those who may have come in a bit late, we're currently changing the facts in the scenario for the purpose of digging deeper into the concept. So one of the changes we made was that we're kind of assuming at this point in this discussion that uh, Richard and Katrina had a relationship at the start, at the time that they entered into this contract with Emma. So there was already a relationship between Richard and Katrina. Now, I want to make a change in the scenario further by suggesting that uh, we take out Emma out of the equation. So it's not just going to be Katrina and Richard. And let's assume further that they did not discuss anything about the paperwork. So they entered into a contract but there was no discussion as to the paperwork. So my question now is, what kind of presumption do you suppose will the law apply in relation to the intention to create legal relations under the contract? Okay, um, from Liu, could you repeat that please? Okay. So we're changing the factual, the scenario, the facts in the scenario, mainly because we want to dig deeper into the, into understanding the concepts here. So one of the changes in the factual scenario would be one, we're assuming already uh, in this change uh, scenario that Richard and Katrina already had a relationship at the time that they entered into a contract to put up this new business venture. So they were already in a relationship. The second change that we're introducing is that Emma is not part of the scenario. So there is no Emma. It's just between Katrina and Richard. The third change in the scenario is that they did not discuss the paperwork. So they just entered into, into, that, um, into that business relationship. So the question that we have here is, what presumption is the law likely to apply in relation to the intention to create legal relations under the contract? Uh, from Martin, are we assuming their status was equal in terms of participation and legal status? Um, okay, I, I okay, let's just make that assumption because I'm I'm not sure how whether or not that is really important. We could we could chase that in a short while. Let's just assume that you know they did even think about it. And so let's assume it's equal. Okay, let's just make the assumption that, that it is equal. What do you suppose would the uh, presumption of the law be in relation to the question of the intention to create legal relations under the contract? So from Liu, the presumption will still be the same, I think. So there would still be an intention to create legal relations, according to Liu. Why is that, Liu? If you could explain your answer there. Yeah, basically, I think um, the presumption is going to be the same because they're, even though they're in a relationship, they're both going beyond that by going into business together as a partnership. Um, so even though they are in a relationship, they can, from a legal point of view, I think they would be seen as a partnership. Um, I think it would still be the same between a married couple as well, even though they are together, they're pretty much going above and beyond that and showing that, yes, we are, we do want to be bound by this contract to perform this act or go into this business. Okay. Uh, that's very good. That's the correct answer there. So the, the, the one thing that we should also notice is that if you look at the cases, 
the times when the courts would consider that there, that there, there can be no presumption of an intention to create legal relations is when it actually involves uh, close family members. And typically, we're speaking here of married couples, or it could be father and son, or it could be uh, arguably cohabiting couples who are not really legally married. But you can see, therefore, the closeness of the, of the personal relationship. That wouldn't apply, that kind of presumption, therefore, which, which happened in Barfer versus Barfer of a married couple, cannot apply in a situation where Richard and Katrina, for example, are just boyfriend and girlfriend. So it's difficult for the law to presume that that same level of uh, emotional tie, uh, which would then lead to the conclusion that there was never an intention to create legal relations, would apply where the two parties are just merely boyfriend and girlfriend. The circumstances where the law will presume a lack of intention to create a legal relation would typically apply only in those instances such as when you have a husband and a wife or when you have a father and son uh, situation or even cohabiting couples, but not you know, when you simply have a, a uh, girlfriend-boyfriend relationship. So that, but that, that's one. But more importantly, what's the more important point here? Assuming that what you have is not just boyfriend and girlfriend. Assuming, in fact, that Richard and Katrina were married. So we're again changing the, I hope this doesn't get confusing, but I, I think we need to do this because otherwise we get the answer, but we haven't really dug, deep, dug deeper into the concept. So assuming that Katrina and Richard were in fact married. Uh, I'm, I'm going to look at uh, Martin's comment in a short while. I'm having, I can't, I can't um, multitask. So, assuming that Richard and Katrina were in fact legally married at the time that they entered into this business venture, would it change anything? Would the legal presumption change? So, assuming Emma was not there, Assuming that they didn't really discuss in detail the issue about paperwork. Okay. The question I have is, and we're not focusing really on company law this time, okay? So we're not focusing on company law. Ignore company law for now. We're just kind of looking at the civil law aspect of this discussion. So focusing on the civil law aspect of this discussion, assuming that Katrina and Richard were legally married at the time that they entered into this business venture, which is quite common among couples, they'd get into a you know, business venture, whether it's about real estate or some commercial development that they develop, what would the possible presumption be of the law concerning the intention of the parties to create legal relations? Assuming that Katrina and Richard were legally married at the time that they entered into the business venture. So from Liu, no, no, uh, the presumption would be the same. Okay, Liu, would you like to explain that, please? Uh, I believe the presumption would be the same because even in the event that they got divorced, if it happened, then they would still be considered as partners under the law. Um, so basically, they're both intending to be bound by this, in, even in the scenario that they separate or get divorced, um, I think that would be considered in their contract. Mm, okay, um, I'm not convinced with that, with that explanation then. Can somebody provide perhaps an alternative explanation why the presumption is likely to be the same? Uh, from Martin, Martin, would you like to take the mic? Um, so as a marriage couple, their, their presumption would of course be that it was personal. However, it's almost a non-starter because the facts clearly demonstrate an intention to play legal relations, which of course does rebut the presumption. Ah, okay. Uh, can you repeat that for me? You made a crucial point there, Martin, which is it in your, in your answer in the chat box. Okay, so the, the, the presumption as a married couple would be that, that it was personal, that there was no intention to create legal relations. However, uh, the presumption would be very easily rebutted because the facts clearly demonstrate an intention to create legal relations. Um, can you just give me a second, please? I just hear somebody knocking on the door. Can you give me a second? Uh, give me a second. Hold on. Can you just give me a second?
Okay, uh, I'm back. Um, Martin, you, you raised something initially, but which you failed to raise again when you started the second time. Uh, okay. uh, is it regarding the presumption being personal or is it regarding the rebuttal of that presumption? You mentioned something about the business relationship. Yes, so um, the, the, the initial presumption is obviously that it was personal, they're married, but they, they're in a business relationship and they've demonstrated the intention to be in a, a, a business relationship. So that's clearly what's in the, that presumption. It, it, it's always been non starter because it's so obvious that it, it would rebut the presumption. Okay, um, thank you, Martin. I'm, I'm going to kind of restate what Martin said, mainly because we've got problems with Martin's mic. Uh, from Heidi, could look in your computer settings. Heidi, are you referring to Martin or are you referring to me? Probably Martin. Probably to Martin. Okay. So let's just be clear. Uh, let's say something about this. The, the question there. So we may we make we change the factual circumstance, the factual scenario, so that we're now confronted with a situation where Richard and Katrina were actually uh, legally married at the time that they, they uh, have this new business venture. And Emma is not in the picture in this changed scenario, okay? So the question was, what presumption will the law apply in relation to the intention to create legal relations? And the answer would be that the law will still, uh, will, will still presume that there was an intention to create legal relations between the parties. Now the question is, why is that? Okay. Why is that? Because remember, if you follow, if you follow Barfer versus Barfer, the assumption, the presumption of the law is that when parties are in a uh, married relationship or in a marital relationship, the assumption is that when parties, uh, when, when a married husband and a wife uh, under, agree to undertake something or undertake to uh, uh, do certain obligations, they couldn't have been intending that they were, they were to be bound by the obligations that they wish to enter into. So in those circumstances, the courts cannot presume that there was an intention to create legal relations where it involves married couples, and we're speaking of Barfor versus Barfor. Now, considering the fact here that we're using this in factual scenario, as in Barfor versus Barfor, the key points at least, that we're dealing with a married couple, how is it that Barfor and Barfor cannot apply? And the reason is because when you look at the legal presumption of when there is an intention to create legal relations, the nature of the relationship between the parties is only one of the factors that you look into. So let me repeat. When you try to apply the legal presumption as to the intention to create legal relations, the relationship of the parties is only one of the elements that you examine. In fact, the more important element that you should consider is really the context in which they ventured into the into the uh, into the business venture in the first place. So if you examine therefore the context, the context clearly was that this was a business venture. And if it was going to be a, a business venture, and they in fact entered into a contract, uh, you know, discussing probably uh, ownership, profits, and so on, because of that context, that context will have to lead to a legal presumption that the parties intended to be bound or that the parties intended to create legal relations under the contract. So in other words, the relationship, the, the, the social relationship between the parties is only one of the elements you examine. The other element you need to crucially examine is actually the context in which the contract was entered into in the first place. So in other words, notwithstanding the fact the parties may in fact be husband and wife, or notwithstanding the fact that the parties may in fact be father and child, or notwithstanding the fact that they, the, the parties may be siblings, or notwithstanding the fact that the parties may be close mates, that will only be one of the factors that will be considered. And crucially, the fa one of the factors that will have to be considered is the fact that if you look at the context, the context is clearly a business relationship which lends itself to the conclusion that naturally, the parties intended to create legal relations in the first place. Was that clear enough? Okay, now, 
let's talk about this notion of presumption in the first place. Let's talk about that notion of presumption in the first place. What exactly is the law currently? What is the status of the law of contracts concerning presumptions? Do we actually begin uh, to make presumptions as to uh, whether or not the parties intend to create legal relations? Is that actually the correct starting point? Would that be the correct starting point? So in other words, would the correct starting point be examine the, um, the social, the nature of the relationship between the parties, and on the basis of an examination of the nature of the relationship of the parties, whether or not there, you know, there's strong intimacy because of family relations or because of the fact that their husband and wife or they cohabiting, do you begin by drawing a legal presumption on the basis of your examination of the nature of the uh, relationship between the parties, or is it going to be something else? What exactly is the current uh, jurisprudence on the subject? Where does the law stand? Do we begin by looking at the presumption or not? Can I get an answer there? So let me repeat, with the correct starting point B, in most circumstances, in most circumstances, with the correct starting point in examining a, a case problem like this, B, to examine the, uh, the nature of the relationship between the parties, the parties in order then to draw a legal presumption as to whether or not the parties intended to create legal relations in the first place. So would that be the correct starting point? to draw legal presumptions on the basis of the nature of the relationship of the parties. What is the current law on that subject? Okay, so from Luke, uh, he says, I'd say it is the correct starting point. It clarifies the party's intentions. Okay. Can I get the answers from everybody else? From Martin, it seems to be. How about the others? Can I get the answers from everybody else? Um, how many people do we have here? I agree the law will decide the intentions from Heidi. Okay. From Martin, seven. What's that? You have a class at seven? Ah, seven people. Okay. Okay. Um, in the case of er Hermogenus versus the Greek Orthodox Church, the uh, judges in that case... Uh, I'll go back to you, Peter, in a short while because I can. I'm going to go back to the chat box. I had difficulty really uh, doing multitasking, so let me just proceed with my point. Then I'll go back to what you said there. So, if you, exa if you examine the case of Hermogenes versus Greek Orthodox Church, the High Court judges uh, felt that it often is not the correct approach to actually proceed by. Uh, looking at legal presumptions on the basis of the nature of the social relations of the parties. Because if you proceed uh, f f using that approach, it may actually lead to a different conclusion because you have a scenario where by characterizing, uh, I mean, by, by looking at the situation as to the nature of the relationship between the parties, it seems to be a matter, a simple matter of saying, there is a social relation, a social relation, a strong social relationship. Therefore, there is no uh, intention to create legal relations. Or you might say that there is no strong social relationship. Therefore, you can assume that there is an intention to create legal relations. So that the high court judges were saying that they are not comfortable with that approach. They're actually saying that the more important point is to actually just examine the context in which the parties entered into a contract in the first place. So they were saying you don't begin by looking at the nature of the relationship by the parties, but by examining the context in which a 
contract was entered into the parties and from there determine, looking at the context, not looking at the nature of the relationship of the parties. So then by looking at the, uh, the context by which, uh, into which, uh, by which the contract was entered into, you can then determine uh, objectively whether or not the parties intended to create legal relations in the first place. So the current state of the law would be Hermogenus versus Greek Orthodox Church, where the High Court said that it is not comfortable with the idea that you begin by drawing legal presumptions on the basis of the strength of the social relationship between the parties. You should look at the context in which uh, the, uh, the contract was entered into in the first place. Now, from Peter, you said earlier that close family relations equal to no legal intention. That is right. So if you examine the case of Barfer versus Barfer and Merit versus Merit, the judges, uh, the courts have said that where there are close family relations that can only lead to the conclusion that the parties were never intended to be bound in the first place. And the reason, and the policy reason for that is quite obvious. Imagine you have, you know, a husband and a wife. Just because, just because the husband, for example, says, uh, you know, I'm going to wash the dishes every night for the rest of our marriage, couldn't possibly be assumed that, that, that the husband intended to be bound to such an extent that the husband can actually be sued uh, for specific performance to, be, to then comply with his, with his side of the bargain. So as a pol policy matter, both in merit versus merit and barfor versus barfor, the courts were clear in saying that um, it is difficult to assume in a, in a situation where you have parties which are bound by close familial ties that they intended to, be, you know, to enter into, to, into legal relations when they undertook obligations in relation to each other. So when a husband, for example, says, you know, I love you so much, and for the rest of your life, no matter what happens, I, I will provide you support and alimony. The courts have, been, have said that the parties couldn't have intended uh, to be bound by uh, legal relations. Instead, the motivating factor in which these parties uh, decided to uh, undertake obligations would have been uh, as a result of probably the products of love, but not the intention to create legal relations. And there is also a pragmatic reason for that. If you allow, you know, parties, I mean, husbands and wives and, and uh, parents and children and close mates to be suing each other uh, on the basis of an undertaking which one of the parties then refuses to, to comply with, then you will be dealing with a situation where courts will be flooded with all of these sorts of... Uh, of uh, failure of one of the parties to comply uh, with, with his uh, so-called legal obligation. So there is a pragmatic reason for that. So you have a policy reason where um, courts clearly cannot assume that, you know, in such close family setting uh, that the parties intended to be bound. That's difficult to make, it's difficult to make an assumption in that case. And more to the point, uh, it creates, there is a pragmatic reason for that. And that is that, you know, courts cannot become the, the forum for the parties to settle, you know, those familiar matter, fa familial matters. Otherwise, courts will be clogged with uh, so many cases that involve uh, a breach of alleged contract or a breach of a bargain by one of the parties uh, in a close uh, social relationship. Now, having said that, though, if you, if you go again through the textbook and the cases that we have, there have, in fact, been situations where the parties were, uh, had a very close social relationship or a very close family relationship, but notwithstanding that, because of the kind of undertakings that the respective parties did and the kind of sacrifices they made, such as, for example, when um, one of the parties in the UK was asked to go to migrate to Australia in order to take care of a, of a, of a parent. And as a result, somebody had to you know, leave possessions there, leave properties, and perhaps leave behind a well-paying job, the assumption in that case is that notwithstanding the nature of the relations between the parties of, of father and son, it will not preclude 
a legal presumption that there was an intention to create legal relations because of the context in which uh, the, the uh, contractual relations were entered into the first place. So in that case, there was a, a, an agreement among the parties in that close family relationship that somebody was going to get money uh, in, in the will when, one, when, you know, when a parent would die. Okay, so uh, we, which is why you might say that the legal presumption that the law would make is actually rebuttable. So we could proceed. Now, moving on, would there be any other questions before we proceed? None? Okay. So, still, um, it is a useful starting point. So, but noting the case of Hermogenos versus uh, Greek Orthodox Church, knowing, you know, just being aware of that case, still we can say that um, it is a useful starting point to make a rebuttable presumption by looking at the nature of the relationship of the parties. So looking at, it's not the, it is the nature of the relationship of the parties that you look at. So if there is, um, so if you, if you go by that useful starting point of examining the nature of the relationship of the parties in order to draw a presumption as to whether or not there was an intention to create legal relations, who then has the burden of rebutting a presumption? So that one is a quick question. We should end up with a quick answer. So in general, who has the burden of rebutting a presumption? What's the answer there? Okay, so for Martin, uh, eventually the person who seeks to rely on that rebuttal. Okay, so the, the person who wishes to go against the presumption obviously has the burden to rebut that presumption. So there is a legal presumption if somebody wants to go against that presumption, then it is that person who will then have the burden to rebut that presumption. So that should be a, a simple matter there. So moving on, um, in the end, is the contract justiciable? So we're not going back to the original scenario. So we're going back to the original scenario. The original scenario is you've got three parties involved, Katrina, Richard, and Emma. Uh, Emma is a third party. We're also assuming that Richard and, and Katrina, at the time that they entered into the business venture, were not in a romantic relationship. So going back to the, fact, the original factual scenario that is in the original tutorial question, the question is, is the contract justiciable? But before we answer that question, can somebody tell us what does it mean when we say that the contract is justiciable? Whether a court can examine it or uh, make a ruling uh, based on it. Okay, that's good. So as, as Martin said, whether or not the courts are, are, are likely to um, accept the case, and uh, you know, make a determination as to whether or not the obligations that the parties entered into would actually be enforceable. So that's what we mean. Uh, if the contract is justiciable, so that's the question of whether the courts will, in fact, uh, accept jurisdiction over the case for the purpose of determining whether or not there is a contract that ought to be enforced by the courts or through the courts. So in other words, if a contract is not justiciable, what it essentially means is that the contract uh, is that the courts will refuse to accept jurisdiction over the case for the purpose of possibly enforcing a contract. So uh, going back to the original factual scenario, therefore, as stated originally in the in the tutorial question, is the contract justiciable? So in other words, is the, is the courts, are the courts likely to attempt to enforce the respective undertakings of the parties? So from Luke, the answer is yes, justiciable according to Sophie and as well as Chris. Okay, thank you. So that, that was easy. In this, in this case, uh, 
Okay, let, let me, so uh, I'll go back to the point of Martin in a short while. So in the factual, the original factual scenario that we have, the courts are likely to, um, to accept the case uh, and for the purpose of enforcing the respective bargains of the parties through the court system. So, the, so in that case, uh, in the end, the contract will be justiciable. So we have a question here from Martin. In such cases, do the courts lack jurisdiction and thus lacking cause of action? Or will they just find against the party relying on it being legally enforceable? So let me repeat the question for those, or maybe I should just copy it and uh, put it in the chat box because this is a uh, crucial question. I'll put it here. So this is the point from Martin. Hold on. So from Martin, uh, in such cases, the, the courts lack jurisdiction and thus lack cause of action. Or will they just find against the party relying on it being legally enforceable? Now we're gonna when we're, we're kind of entering into the area of civil procedure, so I'm just gonna give a quick answer for the purpose of you know providing some clarity, but not going deep into it because uh, we're not discussing civil procedure at this point. There there are many senses in which we speak of jurisdiction. We can speak of jurisdiction over the action. So in other words, that's a question of, is this uh, an action over which the court can have jurisdiction? So there are certain actions, for example, um, there are certain actions which belong uh, solely, if, if, you look at the, if you look at, for example, a state court system, there are certain actions which will only belong to a magistrate's court. There may be certain actions which belong solely to the Supreme Court, depending, for example, on the, the, the jurisdictional amounts or the nature, for example, of a criminal violation. So that's jurisdiction over the action. There are also, there's also the notion of uh, jurisdiction over the persons. So whether or not, um, depending on, uh, on the status of the, per of the persons involved, whether or not you know, courts have jurisdiction over the persons, mainly because whether or not proper summons have been served and so on. Now, when we speak, for example, of whether the contract is justiciable, Essentially what we're saying is that the courts do have jurisdiction over the action. So legally, if they were inclined, they could make a definitive and conclusive decision on the application because they have jurisdiction over the action. Now, however, even if they may actually have jurisdiction over the action, even assuming if, even if we assume that they actually have jurisdiction over the persons, because they have acquired jurisdiction of the persons by a uh, proper service of the summons, the courts may still refuse to actually rule on the action. So that's what we mean by justiciability. So even if the courts actually have jurisdiction over the action, so in other words, they actually have the power to make a conclusive and binding judgment over the action, the courts can refuse to actually exercise its jurisdiction. The courts can actually refuse to exercise its power, in other words, to make a binding and conclusive a judgment or decision on the action. And the courts will refuse that when they feel that the contract is non-justiciable. When the courts will feel that the courts are not the proper forum uh, for, the, for a potential contract, for a contract to be enforced. And the courts will arrive at that conclusion that notwithstanding a power that they have to actually rule definitively and conclusively on the matter, the courts will refuse to exercise their jurisdiction when they feel that, it, it, that you know, a matter is actually non-justiciable, not in the constitution, constitutional law sense, but in the, uh, in the civil law sense, in that uh, the contract is one where it is inappropriate for the courts to intervene, mainly because the courts shouldn't be used as the instrument or tool for the enforcement of non-binding or, or for the enforcement of obligations which the parties did not intend in the first place to be legally binding between them. Was that clear enough? Martin, did that answer your question? Okay, so moving on, let's move on. 
So finally, the, 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 the other question is, what is the strongest argument against your position? So what was your position in the first place? So what position did we have? Um, so the point was, Richard and Emma came to you as a solicitor asking for advice on whether or not, what was the question there? Ah, so th this the question was whether they can terminate the contract they signed when the diner was first opened. So that's a crucial question there. So they have come to you. Uh, so Richard and Emma have come to you as a solicitor, and they want to know whether or not they can actually terminate the contract that they all signed when the diner was first opened. So that's the question that um, Richard and Emma have. So if you were the solicitor, what is your answer there? Let's begin by, by answering that question first. If you were the solicitor, what would you advise? Uh, Emma and Richard asked to their question whether or not they could terminate the contract they all signed when the diner was first opened. So could they terminate the contract? Can I just get the answers in the chat box? Hmm. Okay, so from Liu, no, they can't. Okay, so from Martin, they can't because it's legally binding. Okay, so questions are reached aside. Um, can I get the answers of the others? No, they already signed. Okay, no, they already signed. Okay. Uh, this is from Sophie. I may have a question in relation to that. Um, have we gotten the answers of everyone else, or have we given everyone an opportunity to provide his or her answers in the chat box? So we're good, we can proceed. Okay, now, so there is a general agreement among, uh, in the class that, uh, there's a general agreement in the class that, the part that Emma and uh, Richard can uh, terminate the contract because what they have is actually a legally binding contract because there was an intention to create legal relations in the first place. We're making that assumption. But there is a question here as part of the tutorial question. What is the strongest argument against your position? So can there be an argument that can be made that there is, you know, that the contract can in fact be terminated? Can, can you think of an argument? Or can you think of a way to argue that in fact the contract can be terminated by the parties. Let's think about it, about that for a while. So can you have a situation where the parties can actually terminate the contract? Notwithstanding the same you know, factual scenario. How, if you were a lawyer, how will you argue against or how will you argue that, in fact, Richard and Emma, I'm sorry, Richard, yeah, Richard and Emma can, in fact, terminate the contract? What kind of question can you ask or what kind of uh, additional factual element can you add for you then to be able to make an argument that they can, in fact, terminate the contract without incurring any legal liability? So what can you say? If you were the lawyer here, can you look for an escape clause, a way out for Emma and Richard so that they can actually terminate the contract without incurring any legal liability? So if you were the lawyer trying to be creative here, what factual element can you introduce into the scenario so that then you can say, yes, the contract can be terminated by either or both of you, Assuming the factual scenario would be exactly the same. All I'm asking is for a, another factual element to be introduced. So the, the entire factual scenario is the same. My point is, if you were the lawyer trying to be creative here, what kind of fact, fact can you introduce, a new fact, can you, can you introduce into the scenario so that then you can advise uh, Emma and Richard that it would then be possible for them to terminate the contract without incurring 
any legal liability, what would that be? So trying to be creative here. And um, that will address that point earlier made by Sophie, I think, that can you think of a situation, because Sophie said they already signed, therefore they can't terminate the contract. The, my, the point I'm making is, assuming that the parties in fact sign the contract, okay, they actually sign the contract, can you as a lawyer think of a situation where notwithstanding a contract having been signed, you can actually say that uh, the parties uh, were not, did not really intend to enter into they did not intend to create legal relations in the first place. And therefore, they could actually terminate the contract at will without incurring any legal liability. Can you think of a, uh, of a factual element? You could insert a new element as a lawyer that would then provide an escape clause so that Richard and Emma can avoid incurring any legal liability. Notwithstanding the fact that they actually signed a contract in the first place. So from Chris, that Katrina is not meeting her responsibilities. Ah, okay. Okay, um, that certainly, that's right. So if there is a breach on the part of, that's right. So that's a good answer, Chris. I, I did, I wasn't actually thinking along those lines because that's a topic that is meant to come later. But you are right. Uh, in fact, that's um, contract B. That's actually a, uh, part of contract B. So um, if there is a breach of the obligation of one of the parties, then potentially that can lead to the other parties asking for the termination of the contract because of the breach by one of the parties of the contract of their own obligations. Okay. But again, that is a, uh, a topic for contract B. We're not, we don't include that uh, in contract A, but you're correct. You're correct there. But I will not pursue that, so that's a correct answer, but uh, that is beyond uh, contract A. You're way, you're too, too way ahead, but you're right, okay? Now, my point is, uh, you know, just looking at contract A principles, so in other words, we're not looking at breach of contracts, and the remedy is there because that's, uh, those are topics for contract B. How else can you make an argument that, uh, Richard and Emma can terminate the contract without incurring any legal liability. So from Liu, two of the three parties wish to cancel the contract. Mm, probably not. Ah, from Martin. Would that just give you damages as a remedy? Uh, and I assume Martin was referring to the point here by Chris, that assuming that you know the, the other party uh, has is in breach of the obligation, then that enables the other party to terminate the contract. It all depends. If in that contract they actually provide a provision that the breach by one of the parties of a crucial obligation can enable one of the parties to terminate the contract, then certainly uh, there will be no li uh, no damages that the party who then seeks to terminate the contract uh, will incur. So if there is a provision that would enable a party uh, to terminate the contract on the basis of the fact that one of the parties has breached a crucial uh, obligation in the contract. So when that party exercises that right in the contract, there, he, he or she won't be incurring uh, any, any damages or any legal liability. But that is not my, my, the point there that I was raising. Okay, so, well, uh, I'm not getting any other answers and it's now 7.10. So let me just go, go straight to the point. The question I'd like to raise is, what if, you know, we're introducing a factual scenario here this time, okay? Same scenario, everything is the same, but we're adding a, 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 another fact. What if they actually had an agreement that notwithstanding the fact that uh, they entered into a business relationship, they actually agreed that, uh, you know, they have what is known as an honor clause. Uh, not, okay, that they have an honor clause in the sense that um, they agree that no matter what happens, you know, none of them can sue the other. So that's the nature of an honor clause. You agree that, that you enter into a contract. You agree. Okay, but even when you agree that you're entering into a contract, so you kind of agree that you have respective obligations, 
there is a kedia in the sense that you also have another agreement, actually, that none of the parties can sue the other on the basis of a possible alleged breach of any of the, term, of, any of the terms of the contract. So that's known as an honor clause. Okay? So if you had that kind of honor clause where the parties agreed that they were gonna that they were going to enter into this contract, but with a caveat or the limitation that none of the parties uh, has the power to sue another on the basis of a breach of that agreement. So, so you have an honor clause. The question is, would that honor clause be valid? Is that is that allowed? And you know, would that actually permit the parties to? Terminate the contract without incurring any legal liability. Uh, can I get the answers of everyone? So is an honor clause valid? So you agree that you know, you're, you're entering into a contract, there's a meeting of the minds, and yet there is a caveat, there is a limitation, where you're actually saying that none of the parties has the power to sue the other for a possible breach of the agreement. So there is an agreement, but you further agree that none of the parties has the power to sue the other or the other parties to the contract for failure to abide by the terms of the agreement. First question is, will the honor clause be valid? Okay, so uh, if you examine the case, so that's right, Luke. Uh, yes, so for Marian, it rebuts a presumption in favor of intention. So. So uh, that's right. So if you examine the case of uh, Frank and Rose versus Compton uh, Company Limited, the High Court has ruled that the parties uh, can, in fact, enter into an honor clause so that even if they enter into an agreement to do certain things, there's actually also an agreement that none of the parties can sue the other. That will be valid. And in that case, because of that honor clause, if there is a possible breach of their agreement, the other parties cannot have recourse against the other to sue for specific performance or for breach of the contract. So that would, so in other words, in answer to letter D, the way to argue against that position creatively would be to determine if there might have been an honor clause. And an honor clause uh, can typically happen, like, you know, people who know each other agree, okay, we're gonna enter into this, let's do this together, but we agree that if something, you know, uh, falls foul, we're not gonna end up suing each other. So it could even be in the context of a commercial relationship. So even in the context of a purely commercial relationship between purely commercial persons, the parties can enter into an honor clause that they are not that they don't have the power, that none of them has the power to sue the other for failing to abide by the contract. In the case of Frank and Rose, uh, Company Limited versus uh, Compton Company Limited. The court has ruled that an honor clause is valid. So even in the context of parties who are solely, uh, you know, commercial entities, and in the context of a solely commercial relationship, an honor clause would still be valid. So for Ma for Marty, it's valid, but their business advisor should be shot. Okay, yeah. So is there a precedent where the court has applied that honor clause? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. If I haven't come across it, it's um, the the courts are only uh, able to accept the validity of an honor clause when the parties actually agreed that they did agree to do something that they had an agreement, but that none of the parties had the power to sue the other on the basis of their respective bargains. So, in other words, there is a an agreement already. The parties not to be to be sued if they fail to abide by their uh, by their respective bargains. But um, whether or not the courts will apply an honor clause, I haven't come across one, and it's probably unlikely. Because the, the legal assumption of the law of, of the law will be that you know when all the other elements of the contract are there, such as there is an agreement, there is a meeting of the minds, and there is an intention to create legal relations. Therefore, if you have a contract, the assumption is that the parties are bound by that contract and would not be permitted to evade their obligations under that contract. And that's the nature of an honor clause. The honor clause actually provides you an escape clause 
not to abide by your respective bargains or not to abide by your respective obligations that you entered into in the first place. So the courts are unlikely to imply an honor clause unless the parties um, agree expressly uh, that they have an honor clause. And it would be difficult to assume an, uh, an honor clause because if you have a meeting of the minds, it has to be both parties agreeing that um, there is an honor clause. One cannot, one, you, know, you can't have a situation where one party assumes that it's uh, that there, you know, that, that that person can actually just not comply with the obligation. The courts will not make that assumption because otherwise that contract becomes unenforceable. So where you have a situation where the the obligation of a party to comply with the contract rests on that party as a matter of discretion, the courts will rule that that contract is unenforceable. So that is the, the legal principle that we have. So when the legal obligation of a party to comply with this obligation rests solely on his discretion, in other words, that party had the right not to comply with the obligation, the courts will rule that um, what you have is an unenforceable contract. Because you can't have a contract that rests, you know, with the, whose compliance or performance depends solely on one of the parties. You, can, you know, you, you can't have a, a, a meeting of the minds in that case. So that's the legal principle there. So therefore, given that, it's difficult to, uh, for the courts to likely make a presumption that there is an implicit honor clause. Okay, it's 7.18. Would there be any other questions before we end tonight's topic? Yeah, Manjo, I had a question about exams, if you want me to wait a little bit and ask it at the very end. How about exams? Uh, yeah, yeah, I could, I could stay on. So it won't be relevant to the others, right? Will that be it? Um, yeah, it might be relevant to other people as well. I just haven't seen uh, an exam time uploaded. So I was just wondering if that's going to be done anytime soon. Sorry. Um, okay. So which one is this? Uh, for exam week. Uh, I haven't received any exam time, like day or time. Oh, go do you're talking about the final written assessment, are you, Liu? Is that it? Uh, okay, yeah. Okay. So what we have is not an exam. So we don't have a final exam because if we had a final exam, it means it would have been an invigilated exam where you go to an invigilated center. And in that case, that final exam would have been timetabled. It would have been in the system of the school itself. Now, what we have is a final written online assessment. It is not an exam, which means therefore, it is not uh, timetabled in the school calendar. So instead, the date of the final written assessment depends on the course coordinator. It depends on me. And I think I set the date for the final written assessment. So it's not in the timetable because it is not an exam. So what we have is an exam timetable in the school. This is not an exam. It's not invigilated. It is a, an on, a final written online assessment, which you do on your own wherever you are within a, that set time, which I can't remember how long it was. But I was the one who set the date. It's a, so if it's a final written online assessment, not an exam. It depends solely on the coordinator, sports coordinator, when he or she wishes to set the, that final assessment. Okay, thank you. Uh, anything else before we end tonight's session? Done. So thanks for joining us, and uh, I wish you the best for Christmas. Have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, and I'll join you again next year. Enjoy your Christmas break, everyone. Thank you. Bye.